So uh, I do not recommend FUDR alone, but it can be used alone. So the meta-analysis, unfortunately, was based on a lot of old studies that were really inadequate studies, using crossover in some of them, using 5-FU in some of them. So yes, it came out with that result, but it was based on a lot of poor studies. And the meta-analysis, even though it was based on poor studies, did show a significant increase in response rate with FUDR and did show an increase in survival, 15 months versus 12 months, and that is the usual survival for 5-FU. Now, in the new era of 5-FU, which you mentioned that there was a random, in our randomized study of the COGB, the group receiving the 5-FU had a median survival of 20 months, that's because they were allowed to get arena TCAN or oxaliplanum if they progressed. And there's two large European studies showing a survival of 20 months in patients who get 5-FU and then get CPT and then get oxaliplanum. So as long as they have an ability for the three drugs, their survival can be that high. Now when you mentioned the um, studies about the toxicity, and you mentioned Alan's work, that it, it, which actually includes a lot of the original studies, uh, included my work on the toxicity. You said there was no change, but in Alan's paper, he mentions that if you look at the older uh, period, the, the toxicity rate was 25%, and if you look at a newer period, it's 18%. So the toxicity does go down with more knowledge on how to use the pumps. You mentioned in the... Um, study that we presented in the New England Journal in 1999 that we had two deaths in the pump group. The two deaths were surgical deaths before any treatment that were in the pump group, but they were surgical deaths, and there was one death on the systemic group, also surgical death. So our statisticians didn't think there was any difference between two and one death. These were surgical deaths. They had nothing to do with the treatment. Um, now, going back to the toxicity of stents, it's certainly a toxicity that we don't want, but from our original study in the um, New England Journal, two of those patients who required biliary stents are still alive greater than 10 years. So even though it is a complication, that doesn't mean the patient's going to die from the uh, procedure. Um, now, the systemic chemotherapy certainly is moving up and we're getting much better results with systemic chemotherapy. But the studies looking at um, Albert's study and Posey's study looking at systemic chemotherapy and then patients going to resection, first of all, some of those patients were resectable in the first place. Second of all, they're upfront therapies. We're producing these results as second-line therapy. So we're getting 37% of our patients to go to resection second line and getting 57% to go to resection first line. So certainly you can do something with systemic chemotherapy. The question is, can we increase the odds of getting a patient to that event? Can we increase the response rate, which we seem to be doing with the combined treatment, and can we increase the odds? Now, in showing my study um, from the New England Journal, you showed the survival curve from 1999 and said that it wasn't a good survival curve, but you didn't show our updated survival curve which was published in 2005. And, and this is a problem for a lot of these studies. If you produce a survival curve like Lorenz's study at one year after the study begins and you don't look at the patient's way out, the survival may change dramatically if you look at the survival at 10 years versus one year after you start the study. Then you mentioned in the ECOG study that it did not show an overall survival. It was it was the ECOG study was supposed to show an increase in disease-free survival. It was never expected to show an increase in overall survival since only 100 patients were entered. So you can't use that as a reason why that it doesn't show overall survival. It never expected to show overall survival with 100 patients. So that's my comments. Dr. Abdallah, three minutes. Well, I'll start at the bottom. The ECOG trial, I don't think, was an intention to treat uh, progression-free survival analysis, so I'm not sure that's valid either. But it's important, again, to recognize that we're dealing with a systemic disease. We, we, lack the, we lack the data to, at this point, even looking at the randomized trials that have been done, to 
call this a standard of care. The movement or pro progress with HAI therapy, with all due respect to the incredible work you've done with prospective randomized trials, um, has been slow. The movement with systemic therapy has been fast. The translatability of systemic therapy is great. The utility of systemic therapy is established. The treatment with systemic therapy of a systemic disease is oncologically appropriate. And even you know, in the case that the systemic therapies fail and we are seeking a salvage approach, because admittedly HAI has activity, I think it can be considered. So taken together, we have to realize that the outcome of surgery is improving as well. And so impacting that, uh, that uh, survival improvement is more difficult. The outcomes with systemic therapy is better. So we have to Im improve on that. And so the complication rate associated with placement of a pump or delivery of the therapy, the failure of a significant portion of patients to get the therapy impairs your ability to translate that therapy to all of our patients. And so I think we have failed yet to demonstrate that HAI therapy is the way to go. And uh, 